When it comes to regulating the urinary system, we can use both the nervous system and the endocrine system to do this. As we go through this process though, keep in mind that a lot of times when we're making changes to the urinary system function, we're actually doing that not for the sake of the urinary system, but we're trying to affect something else like blood composition or blood pH or blood volume or blood pressure. And that's not to say that everything the urinary system is using for regulation is for other things. It does do some self-regulation to protect itself. The self-regulation is called autoregulation. And when this autoregulation occurs, it's not usually typically affecting the entire body, just the local nephrons where the action is taking place. And don't forget there's three steps to urine formation, and we can regulate all three of those steps. We can regulate filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. We're first going to take a look at how we can use hormones to regulate the urinary system, and then we'll take a look at how we can use the nervous system to regulate the urinary system. We can use angiotensin II as a hormone to regulate the process of glomerular filtration. And then we can use other hormones to regulate tubular reabsorption and secretion. Those hormones will be parathyroid hormone, aldosterone, and antidiuretic hormone. But we're first going to start with regulating glomerular filtration using hormones, in this case angiotensin II. In order to understand how angiotensin II is going to help us to regulate glomerular filtration, we have to just kind of understand the basics of regulating glomerular filtration first. And in order to do that, we need to know a little bit about something called glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. And this is what it sounds like. It's just the rate at which blood is being filtered. The kidneys require a relatively constant glomerular filtration rate in order to function. And don't forget that the process of glomerular... And of course, we know that the process of glomerular filtration is dependent on blood pressure. So blood pressure determines filtration pressure, which determines glomerular filtration rate. Blood pressure is not something that stays constant throughout our day. Blood pressure is changing all the time, whether we're getting stressed out or exercising or resting. And the kidneys have to be able to maintain a constant glomerular filtration rate in order to filter those wastes out of the blood, despite any changes that are happening in blood pressure. So how are we gonna do this? Is if blood pressure is constantly fluctuating, right? even just with the beat of the heart, right? When we know when the heart contracts, there's a high pressure in arteries, and then when it relaxes, there's a low pressure. We need to be able to keep that, that GFR the same despite any changes in blood pressure. The main way we're gonna do this, the main way we're gonna answer this problem is to put less blood into the glomerulus if the blood pressure is high, and then put more blood into the glomerulus when blood pressure is low. And the main way we're going to do that, in other words, control the amount of blood going into the glomerulus, is by constricting or dilating the afferent arterial. We can also use the afferent arterial, as we'll see in a little bit. If we dilate the afferent arterial, that means more blood will be getting into the glomerulus because the space of the arterial is wider and more blood can get through. If more blood is getting into the glomerulus, there's more blood pushing on the walls of the glomerulus, so there's a higher blood pressure in the glomerulus. If there's a higher pressure, that means there's going to be more filtration. That means more substances will be moving out of the glomerulus into that capsular space. And this means we're, we have a higher GFR, we have a higher glomerular filtration rate. If we're forming more filtrate, then typically that means more urine will be formed. The opposite is also true. If we constrict the afferent arterial, then less blood's going to get to the glomerulus. And that means the pressure in the glomerulus will be lower. We have less filtration due to that lower pressure trying to push out into the capsular space. So we have a lower glomerular filtration rate, we have less filtrate being formed, and less urine being formed. We know that constriction of the afferent arterial means less blood will get into the glomerulus. But what would happen if we 
constricted the afferent arterial a little, but constricted the efferent arterial a lot, what would happen to the pressure inside the glomerulus then? So that means we have a little bit coming in and a very little bit going out, and that's going to make that filtration pressure much higher in the glomerulus. And we are going to use that particular process with angiotensin II. So angiotensin II is used to regulate glomerular filtration. In order to understand this process, we need to take another look at that juxtaglomerular apparatus. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus is a series of cells that are located next to and within the glomerulus. We have juxtaglomerular cells, which are mostly cells that are wrapping around the afferent arterial. And then we have macula densa cells, which are a specialized type of cell in the wall of the distal convoluted tubule. And it's the portion of the distal convoluted tubule that's coming up right against the glomerulus. The macula densa cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus release chemical signals when they detect low flow rate within the distal convoluted tubule. So they're basically sampling the, the flow rate within that tubule. Typically, we see a low flow rate within the renal tubule when the blood pressure is low. In addition to detecting flow rate, the macula densa cells can also detect the amount of sodium in the tubular fluid, and we'll talk more about that later. So the chemical signals that are released by the macula densa, they don't have to travel very far. They're just going right to their nearby juxtaglomerular cells. These JG cells are smooth muscle cells, and they're wrapping around the afferent arterial. When they receive the signals from the macula densa, the JG cells constrict. We're going to talk more about this later. There's a second function though. When the macula densa cells send signals to the JG cells, it also causes the JG cells to release renin. And we learned about renin in our cardiovascular unit. There's the RAAS, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Renin is released into the bloodstream where it will activate angiotensinogen, a blood plasma protein, turning it into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will then be converted into angiotensin 2 by another enzyme, ACE, which stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin 2 is needed in this situation because it's going to cause the afferent and efferent arterioles to constrict. So if we constrict our afferent arteriole and then also constrict the efferent arterial, then that means we are going to have blood pooling in this glomerulus because the out valve is smaller than the in valve. And this higher pressure in the glomerulus is necessary to increase, excuse me, to increase the glomerular filtration rate back to normal, which will correct for the low flow rate that was previously detected by the macula densa. We're not quite done with the angiotensin II. We know that angiotensin II is also a very potent body-wide vasoconstrictor. And by causing body-wide vasoconstriction, it will increase blood pressure. Now remember, the problem in the first place was the macula densa cells detected a low flow rate in the DCT. And this is caused when we don't have enough glomerular filtration pressure, which is mostly determined by blood pressure. Right? So if the blood pressure is low, the GFR is low, and that flow rate is low, so the angiotensin II, by causing body-wide vasoconstriction, will increase blood pressure, and that will increase the pressure in the glomerulus, and then increase that flow rate in the DCT. And don't forget, this is part of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So there is a role for aldosterone here, too. Angiotensin II is the hormone that causes the release of aldosterone from the adrenal glands. Aldosterone is going to target the kidneys, causing sodium reabsorption with simultaneous potassium secretion. So we have that linked reabsorption and secretion occurring. By reabsorbing sodium, water likes to follow sodium, so we will also reabsorb water. 
and by reabsorbing water will increase blood volume, which increases blood pressure, which will also increase that low flow rate that was previously detected by the macula densis cells.